Welcome to the Deadly Addictions channel. Today I'm going to be doing a podcast on the sciences. This is the Drake Equation. Estimating the odds of finding ET. First off, I had a interesting, really fun conversation for almost two days with a friend of mine. And we were talking about UFOs and the phenomenon, all that stuff. And it got my brain going. And I remember doing a podcast not too long ago in the sciences and talking about things like the Drake equation, the great filter, and the Fermi paradox. And I thought, you know what? Let me search those out and do a podcast on them. So that's why I'm going to be doing that today. Uh, most likely, you'll find the link in the description, as always. If not, let me know. I'll read the article word for word here and there. I might inject something at the end. I'll wrap it up. And that's really what I do here for these science um, podcasts. It's interesting, like I said, because of the conversation I was having and looking at the old podcast and seeing all these links lead into other things. Just going through life. I'm, almost, I'm 50 now. You, you know, you want to brush up on these things. But it was really interesting on, you know, what is the phenomenons we see now? And just the whole conversation just got me going. So this is from the space.com website. It's by Elizabeth Howell. I'll let you know if there are links in there, but I'll begin now. The Drake equation is used to estimate the number of communicating civilizations in our galaxy. Or more simply put, the odds of finding intelligent life in the Milky Way. First proposed by radio astronomer Drake, or Frank Drake in 1961, the equation calculates the number of communicating civilizations by multiplying several variables. It's usually written according to the search for extraterrestrial intelligence study as N equals the number of civilizations in the Milky Way galaxy whose electromagnetic emissions are detectable. R the rate of formation of stars suitable for the development of intelligent life. FP, the fraction of those stars with planetary systems. NE, the number of planets per solar system with an environment suitable for life. FL, the fraction of suitable planets on which life actually appears. FI, the fraction of life bearing planets on which intelligent life emerges. FC, the fraction of civilizations that develop a technology that releases detectable signs of their existence into space. L, the length of time such civilizations release detectable signals into space. You'll see I put on the thumbnail of the, uh, you'll see on the screen, it's an equation and it's, um, I don't know if you can read it, it's a, fucking image size i'll continue the challenge at least for now is that astronomers don't have firm numbers on any of those variables so any calculation of the drake equation remains a rough estimate for now there have been however discoveries in some of these fields that give astronomers a better chance of finding the answer the recent discoveries of rocky worlds near proximity proxima centauri a star of the Alpha Centauri system, and TRAPPIST-1 have increased the public's attention on the search for life. These stars, however, are red dwarfs that might be too volatile for life. More study is needed to understand where life might be possible, and whether it could persist long enough to communicate with other civilizations. Exoplanet Discoveries Exoplanet <laughs> Astronomers certainly could imagine the existence of other planets outside the solar system in 1961, but it took until 1995 until the first confirmed exoplanet was found, around a main sequence star called 51 Pegasi b. The discovery ushered in a new era when astronomers were able to track down many other planets across the universe. I'm going to stop real quick. This article has lots of underlying sentences which lead to links, and you might find other studies, and really interesting, um, good uh, tool to have. I'll continue. Traditionally, 
Planets have been found through two methods. Watching them transit across a star, which causes a dimming that can be measured from Earth, or examining the gravitational wobbles the planets induce as they orbit around their parent star. More recently, a technique called veri verification by multiplicity allows astronomers to quickly identify multiple planet systems. Estimating the total number of planets in the universe is difficult, but one statistical study suggests that in the Milky Way, each star has an average of 1.6 planets, yielding 160 billion alien planets in our home galaxy. This, the study used a technique called gravitational lensing that observes changes in light curves when a relatively nearby star passes in front of more distant objects. And then it has a link related 13 ways to hunt intelligent aliens. So that's cool. You'll see other articles. Maybe I've even done podcasts on them. As of March 2018, more than 3,708 exoplanets have been confirmed. The vast bulk of them were due to an observatory called the Kepler Space Telescope, which scrutinized a single spot in the Cygnus constellation between 2009 and 2013, before switching to its K2 mission, which rotated between different locations in the sky. Plumbing the data, astronomers continued to make discoveries from the information. Suitable for life? While Jupiter-sized planets are easier to spot in telescopes due to their large size and effect on their parent star, emerging research from the Kepler Space Telescope suggests that rocky planets are extremely common. A slew of Kepler discoveries, announced in February 2014, for example, mainly contain super-Earths, or planets that are slightly larger than Earth and are considered by many astronomers to be habitable under the right conditions. Habitability is usually defined as the zone around a star in which a rocky planet can maintain liquid water on the surface. And by the way, all, all those things are subject to change. It's just what we think about. We'll continue. Among the planets discovered by all telescopes, however, only a tiny fraction of them are likely to have an environment suitable for life. Astronomers can't measure this metric for sure yet, but a few factors likely come into play, such as how close a planet is to its parent star and what its atmosphere contains. As of March 2018, the Habitable Exoplanets catalog has 53 planets that, optimistically, could be suitable for life, and among those, 13 that are more likely to be habitable. The project is part of the Planetary Habitability Laboratory at the University of Puerto Rico at Arecibo. 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 <laughs> Quote, these are artistic representations of all the planets around other stars' exoplanets, with any potential to support surface life as we know it. The catalog states below an illustration of the planets. All of them are larger than Earth, and we are not certain about their composition and hab habitability yet. We only know that they seem to have the right size and orbit to support surface liquid water. Related 5, and there's another link to the article. I really like this site for that. Finding life outside of Earth, even microbial life, would be an important step toward better understanding the Drake equation. Astronomers, in fact, have not given up on finding life within our own solar system. There are several areas that could host habitable environments now, or did in the past, such as the planet Mars or Jupiter's moon Europa. The next step would be determining how to send a message to extraterrestrials and whether they could receive or understand it. On a small scale, astronomers have beamed messages to the stars, and in a few cases, put disks on board spacecraft such as Voyager for anyone in the neighborhood to read and potentially find Earth for further communications. Red Dwarf Stars The catalog of known exoplanets also contains a number of planets circling red dwarf stars, which are smaller and dimmer than our own sun. It was easier to spot a planet blocking the sun as it goes across its face. From Kepler's past vantage point, it was also easier to confirm if the planet was indeed a planet, since the planet orbiting 
A smaller star will exert a stronger tug visible in radial velocity measurements. <laughs> to be a scientist, I guess. Since red dwarfs produce less energy than the sun, any rocky planets in a habitable zone must huddle closer to the star to get enough heat to maintain liquid water on the surface. Two discoveries in particular attracted a lot of public attention. In 2016, astronomers discovered a rocky planet orbiting Proxima Centauri, a member of the Alpha Centauri star system that is only four light years from Earth. Then in 2017, seven Earth-sized rocky planets were confirmed around the star TRAPPIST-1, which is only 40 light years from Earth. Some of those planets may be in the habitable zone. Habitable zone. <laughs> habitable zone. Emerging research on red dwarf stars, however, suggests they may not be very friendly for life. In the example of Proxima Centauri b, the planet is so close to its star that scientists suggest it might be tidally locked. This means that one side of the planet always faces the star, and the other side always faces space. One side of the planet would be very hot, and one side of the planet would be very cold, unless there are winds to distribute the heat around. These conditions are challenging for life. Even red dwarf stars in general may be troublesome locations. They are more volatile volatile than our sun, particularly when they are young. The stars can send out flares and also coronal mass ejections, which are charged particles. Over time, CMEs can slowly rip away an atmosphere by removing molecules from the top. According to 2017 studies led by the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland, even if a star doesn't send out CMEs, there's a chance it will blast our X-ray radiation. It will blast out X-ray radiation, which could kill any life on the surface. By the way, again, lots of these sentences have links that will bring you to other articles that will explain all these things. Astronomers are carrying out studies of red dwarf stars to determine how dangerous they may be. But further studies of these systems may require further t future telescopes. Starting in 2018, NASA's TESS, Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, will study closer and brighter stars than Kepler did, potentially generating dozens of potentially habitable planets. And the agency's James Webb Space Telescope will launch no earlier than 2020 with the ability to look at some planets' atmospheres in the infrared to learn more about their composition. Meanwhile, the European Extremely Large Telescope, EELT, is under construction in Chile. Or is that Chile? Oh, yeah, whatever. And first light expected in 2024. All right, so that ends the article. These things get me all used up, and my mind gets really exploring the possibilities. I was also telling my friend that, um, you know, my spirituality is... It's the aura of the universe. And these are, these are things like this. So, in talking about this, I'll eventually get to, like I said when I first started, the Fermi paradox, the dark forest theory, uh, the great filter. And these are all hypotheses and ideas about um, the logic of things or the, just the common sense practicality of, all right, so why aren't aliens right now communicating us and where are they and I'm, some of these conversations i was having was like the intent we put behind them and my just you know where my mind leads is you know possibly alien probes from other civilizations maybe they're still around maybe they're not depending on you know all these factors like how many years before us or our planet were they um, building their civilization is are they a million years ahead of us, right? I well, who knows? Well, that whole you know spectrum of guessing and ideas that I could see. Like you know, I wouldn't be su so surprised if uh, classical class uh, classified documents revealed and we've been studying a probe we found, whatever, and it's at Area Fifty One or whatever the fucking fuck. Like I would actually believe that the idea of sentient creature beings in planes flying around was the focus of some of our conversations and it was like well you know what 
the intent behind that and just a fascination with you know what we do as a species uh you know we're sending things to mars and probes and what makes sense does it make sense to come every time and kidnap us and do tests on us and mutilate our cows um how many crop circle debunks do we have to see before you know all these things are fascinating they're great conversations and i like i said i figured i'd go to the foundation of some of these things that science treats uh somewhat legitimately just just the equation and well i don't know what the fuck the equation means like all these factors i wouldn't know how to write it out if someone asked me to i wouldn't know how to um, explain it because it's actually N E R X F P X N E X F L X F X F C X L. It's just like it's on my fucking screen right now when I'm looking at it. It's like, yeah, and I described it in the beginning, but I'm not a scientist, and this is just some fascinating stuff. How do we figure out the possibility of these things? Why haven't we seen aliens? And I'll get into that into some of my other ones, as I was talking about, like the dark forest theory. Um, I'll quickly touch on, um, what is it? The, uh, all right, so the dark forest theory, a terrifying explanation of why we haven't heard from aliens yet. Um, the Fermi paradox was, uh, there's actually, a, I think there's a fucking formula for that too. I'm not sure. But the Fermi paradox of where are the aliens? It tries to answer the questions of where the aliens are, given that our star and Earth are part of a young planetary system. So all that science, and I just get my mind blown by there are people for years they study this, they do the math that works out. It it really uh, you know leaves me in awe and wonder. You know I know how to drive well. I can play guitar. I find myself creative. I think I can write a little bit. You know, and I think I maybe might be somewhat of um, a sarcastic asshole, but in no way do I say, oh, you know, I could take apart a car and put it back together. Which is why I so am respectful and understanding of like mechanics and you know doctors. And it's just it just blows my mind where I would have seen myself in some alternate reality this would be my life it would be just to figure out the mysteries of the universe hope everybody enjoyed the podcast and again it was the drake equation estimating the odds of finding et going through the formula as it is in science to most of the things we've done already like i said the article i'll put the link in the description plenty of links that are highlighted in blue you can hit them and find out about other things that the article is talking about, I recommend it. This one does not have a listen to button, I don't believe. But, hey, what are you going to do? It's space.com. Everybody, I hope you're doing well. My best to you and yours. Take care till next time. Bye-bye.